we talk about it at conferences and discuss it over coffee. We should get institutional investors, the pension funds, the insurance companies, and the very large asset managers investing in this space. But very few people have actually raised from these players and thought about their role. Today, we are joined by someone who has done just that and plans to raise a lot more and put it to work. As the early stage space is slowly getting crowded, luckily, we need to start thinking about who can write $100 million or euro checks to give the scale-ups in the region, ag and food tech space, the time to really grow. And we discuss why now is the moment for regenerative food and ag as healthcare costs are getting out of control, institutional players are forced to invest in impact, technology and raw computational power make almost magic possible. And most importantly, the enormous influx of talent focusing on food, ag and soil. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities, and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another episode. Um, one that's been a long time in the making. Friend of I can I can say friend of the podcast or a follower and, and supporter as well, which obviously I want to thank Eric for. I've been following the, the, the journey of Eric and, and Astanor and also Quadia for, for a long time. We had Quadia many, many years ago. I think it was the first 30 episodes or something. Um, but I really wanted to have Eric on to explain a bit of his journey into, into this fascinating world of impact investing and then even deeper into food and ag. So welcome. Thank you for hosting us as a podcast in your uh, office with a magnificent view uh, on, on the city of, of Brussels. And I see some... Uh, some wind turbines turning. Not so many farms, but probably if I look far enough, I can see some. But welcome on the podcast and thank you for making time. Thank you very much, Kun. And to start with the personal question we always love to ask, um, why soil? With all the career paths you could have chosen, um, I would say after your time in Silicon Valley, like you could have gone a hundred different routes. How did you end up in, in the world of food, ag, farming, and, and not the easiest path, let's say, and impact investing? Well, impact investing is um, is something I've I've been, you know, growing into for over fifteen years now. Um, but what led me to soil is 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 more like food that led me to soil. Um, one is I'm definitely a big foodie. Got involved in <laughs> got involved in in a number of uh, of food related projects, personal projects, including investing in, in a few restaurants, not because of the, um, you know, trying to make money. You never make money in the restaurants. Um, Listen to this. If you're interested, if you're at the curve of investing in a restaurant for the money reasons, uh, step back and, and think of it as, yes. as a hobby, because statistically you're not going to do it. Yet. You're not going to make money. Even in the best restaurants, at, at, at best, you're going to get your money back. But I, I was very fortunate to meet a few chefs that were really uh, inspiring in their, you know, their vision of, of um, the need to change the, um, our approach to food. And, and, and that led to, in the supply chain, to where this food came from. And, and, and working with a, a few scientists also, um, again, being, um, you know, I, I, became close to um, one of the chefs in, in very well-known chefs in, in London called Jamie Oliver, uh, who through a series of, of um, evolution in our relationship asked me at some point to become chairman of his uh, foundation for food education, which was mostly working with kids. And, um, and I discovered 
um, the, the really deep problems of our food system, uh, which has been, uh, and I've said that a couple of times before, but has been um, developed over the past 70 years um, to deliver very efficiently cheap calories throughout the world, but not cheap nutrients. And, and uh, in doing so, we have been producing huge problem in, on the health side. So um, people are, you know, are being, um, you know, they, they develop all kinds of metabolic uh, diseases, especially uh, diabetes type 2 that should not exist in, in, in the world, but uh, unfortunately does exist and it's touching more and more people. In the US, it's, it is estimated today that 30% of people who are born after 2000 will have developed diabetes type 2 by 2030. So, you know, this which series is tomorrow, of, basically. It's, it's tomorrow, it's huge. And the other number which I wanted to give before I go back to the soil is that, uh, which is a really scary number. Um, today, Americans spend $1.1 trillion on food every year. And by, a little bit by coincidence, but definitely um, but you know, it's linked. The healthcare system in the US spends 1.1 trillion, the same amount of money, to try to, I mean, to, to um, try to, to cure the um, diseases that are caused by the poor nutrition of people. And we're talking mostly about diabetes type 2. Plus, then another 1.1 trillion. Yeah, another two times that amount. I think there was a Rockefeller study yes. on true cost accounting. The, the, the cost of the food system just in the US is three times what right. the US population spends on it. So right. it's the health and then two times environmental and social. Exactly. And then I get to the so story. Four, basically. Four the, X. No, it's three X. So 1.1 spent on, on, on the food by, by the consumers. 1.1 spent partly by the same consumers, partly by the state um, to um, to you know, to deal with the uh, healthcare issues. And 1.2 trillion spent that is not uh, being uh, accounted for really today, but is the cost to the environment, including the soil, a lot to the soil, biodiversity, environmental, and so on. And so it all starts with the soil. It all starts with the fact that we have been uh, growing monocrops but do you remember when that clicked? I mean, you, you started with food and, and of course the connection with these chefs to soil. But do you remember, was there one moment yes. or multiple when you were like, whoa, it all starts with soil. Like this is not totally. just on the taste, but also actually on the environmental piece, which is a, for many, I think, actually for me, it was a big shift going from, ah, oh, of course, if we eat better food, it's better quality, better taste, better paid for farmers, et cetera, et cetera. But to see the switch to water, carbon, biodiversity, like it literally all starts with the soil, was quite an eye-opener for somebody who didn't grow up on a farm. Was that the same for you? Was it a natural, um, like to see the potential of, the, the, the issues and the potential of soil in, in these, all these areas on health, carbon, water, biodiversity? So as I said, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up uh, in a farm. I didn't uh, study. Um, at, well, I spent quite a bit of time now with uh, scientists from UC Davis, from um, from Vanenigan, from other places on on agri now. But at the time, um, I I was really new into that that space. So I came from this food side, um, being really aware of how you know all the things around corn and uh, high fructose uh, corn syrup, all the things that you know, I got into, you know, trying to understand these monocultures and, and, and how, including in Europe, the monoculture, which is um, sponsored by the subsidies you know, to keep this uh, statu quo, where you basically have a system that you keep um, um, subsidizing not just the farmers, but the, the system that brings all the, you know, all the entrants that you have to put in the soil. And, and the soil becomes just a, a very um, dead substrate. And, and the haha -ha moment on the soil itself goes entirely, the credit goes to um, my friends at Soil Capital. So I became, I became uh, at that time, at the very beginning of Soil Capital, uh, Chuck, came to me, I became the first private investor in soil capital because I really believed in the vision of, of soil, of, um, of truck. 
And he took me um, to Frederick Thomas' farm in Sologne. And, and, and Frederick Thomas showed me the difference between his soil, was using regenerative agriculture, and the soil of, of his um, neighbor, who did not see the point uh, of using it. I, I think today he still doesn't see the point, the neighbor, because he gets all the subsidies, you know, to do Why things. would you? Yeah. And, and suddenly it was the aha moment when, when Frederick started to dig in the soil and showed me the difference in the soil between the two. And, and everything clicked together. You know, I had read a number of books on, on the invention of uh, synthetic fertilizers and all these things. And then suddenly I saw that. It, it was very abstract until then. And that very moment uh, was the, the famous aha moment where I said, geez, you know, this, there's something to be done here. And I started to dig in, you know, whether there would be a number of uh, technologies that could be developed and, and or sponsored for that. And that was by serendipity. I met, uh, no, I didn't meet because I already met her before, but this um, very famous scientist in France who happened to have a summer house next to my summer house in, in France. Serendipity. Uh, yeah. Serendipity, Dr. Pascal Cossard, who is the... Um, Secrétaire Perpétuelle de l'Académie des Sciences, so she's like the, the chairman, chairwoman of the uh, French Science Academy, so, you know, someone fairly, fairly um, knowledgeable. And she's the person that actually discovered the, the role of Listeria and, the, 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 you know, how Listeria goes from cows to the soil back to the, to the, the cows and everything, and how things there's a link between the microbiome of the soil and the microbiome of the, of the animals and, and people. And until her research in the 1990s, people did not really understand that there was a microbial, microbial life on the soil because it's anaerobic, which means that as soon as you bring it to a lab, the it's lab, it's dead. So you don't see anything. You say, okay, you know what? We don't have to worry about it. Just put NPK and everything will be fine. So her work or pioneering work with Listeria gave birth to all the things we've been looking at. In, and, and it was a very new, a very new field of understanding the uh, microbiome and of the undersoil. And you were discussing that in, like, in front of your summer house. Yes. To, and, you happened to talk about gardening maybe in soil. You discovered that she was... And fishing. And fishing, and that she was that key figure or... Yes. Yeah. And, I, dis I said, wow, you know, this is, this is a signal, you know, I have to do something about that. So between the, you know, uh, visit to Frédéric Thomas, then a few weeks later, my discussion with Pascal, and I said, you know, this is fascinating, you know, things are happening right now, there's a, there's a new sector, there's a new potential revolution, and then my friends in Silicon Valley, um, around 2009, there was a big breakthrough in uh, deep learning, okay, so I my, the first company I started as a, as a, as a CEO and co-founder was a, one of the first deep learning company, but way too early. It was very frustrating. We didn't have enough computing power. We are dealing with single layer neural networks. Sh shallow learning, yeah. Shallow learning, single layer neural networks, very slow. It was a bit frustrating from that point of view. And then my friends, at, who, the people I hired in my company, fresh out of universities in the in the early 90s, where, there, where by then senior or even uh, senior engineers or even uh, managers or directors of data mining in the big companies at Google. And, and so a friend of mine actually was the uh, head of search for Google and working on all these things. And then, um, you know, some people who worked for me ended up being the head of data mining for Amazon and for Twitter so and good, things. A good birthplace for many careers. Let's yes, say. exactly. But they were reporting to me with a lot of excitement this breakthrough in, in artificial intelligence. And I kind of think, mm, maybe, you know, there's something to be done between, you know, applying that to, um, so basically what has become today, you know, synthetic biology and all these things. So I started to look and I found that there were quite a few people working on that already, starting to work on that. So I said, okay, you know what, this is happening. There is a big breakthrough, a combination of AI and biology. That's going to change. It will eventually change the way we look at agriculture. It's going to be changing the way we have been looking at things. We have been making very 
important simplification that are not correct anymore. Um, you know, agriculture is not linear, it's not NPK gives uh, life, it's much more complex than that. And now we have the, we have the, the means from a you know, computing, computing um, capacity to actually have much more complex models that will lead to a new order in the way we look at things. So it's a, it's a very high level kind of thinking. Yeah, but it's a, it's a fundamental question that I think investors like yourself as well ask, okay, why now? Like we, we knew or there's been reports coming out on the poor quality of soil and it's going down and of course books coming out for the last 20, 30. In some cases, if you go back with David Montgomery to, to 100 years ago, I mean, the early uh, organic pioneers in, in the UK did observe, like observe science, but still saw the connection between healthy soil and other things. And, and we still went on the path of 70 years of, of extremely intensive extractive ag and food. So why now is it different? And the underlying answer in your case seems and there's a huge breakthrough in computing power, which enables 10,000 other things or, or we cannot even imagine yet. And so you said, okay, I'm not going to continue, or maybe you can, you of course, continue part of that in my um, foundation work and NGO work, but I see an opportunity here to apply my, my VC and my, my Silicon Valley knowledge into this new world and apply this, this breakthrough into ag and food. Was that already, like, was it a logical step? Like you, you from those few weeks of, of these, these serendipity encounters, was it a very logical step to you to found Astana or, or like what happened to the team is like, okay, this is actually, this could be a, a massive investment opportunity or it has to be, and it should be, and then let's build that compared to many other paths you could have chosen, like invest in some of these or set up a foundation to push against corn syrup and, or to push uh, com computational um, and, and deep learning. Like what was that click to, okay, we're going to build an investment house, like quite a, a substantial one. We'll talk about that. And to invest in this space because there's a the, the why now is now. Um, yeah, I, I think <laughs> I think it is. Um, it's exactly what you what you described was this aha moment that I said, okay, there should be something happening, but quite frankly, um, there was enough naivete in in my um, in my you know in my thinking. I didn't know enough about the sector to um, <laughs> to think. Okay, it's going to be so difficult. I shouldn't do it. I think if I had been a a, a really it's going to be deep, question, yeah. <laughs> a deep expert in the area, maybe I, sh I would have said, you know what, I'm going to stay in in uh, you know what we didn't call metaverse at the time and and do uh, gaming. But the the thing that really pushed me into that is I'd been fairly schizophrenic for a, a while, you know. Um, making investments in companies that were making money, whether they were social networks or Spotify or whatever at early stage, fascinating, um, you know, work to, to be a venture capitalist is, is really great. And, and I'm super grateful I've been able to do that for a long time. And when companies actually do succeed in becoming big yeah, companies, you might be listening to this through Spotify exactly. as a podcasting player. Yeah, but it's, there was something itchy. Right. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating to do that. But at the same time, I, I, you know, schizophrenia came from the other side of my my work. Non for profit was to you know work with social entrepreneurs, which were not very scale. You know, they were not scaling um, for the most part. Actually, all of them, none of them were really scaling when you think about, it. and. And then I saw the possibility of doing uh, the two things together. And that gave me a boost of energy, you know, like, wow, you know, maybe I can do something which is meaningful, which is really fun and, and making money at the same time so that uh, making money is very, very important because it gives you the sustainability. It gives you the, uh, the attractiveness of working with more and more investors and really have a, the potential maybe one day to have a systemic impact and which is really what I've been aiming for. Can we as a, as a firm have a systemic impact on the planet on, of course, we're not going to change the entire planet, but can we have, you know, some, for some parts of the system, can we really change it because of some of the investments we made, some of the risk we took, some of the conviction we managed to bring to others. 
And that's really exciting and much more than making money for the sake of making money and much more than giving money to a charitable organization that, you know, you feel good about it, but you know that it's not going to change the world. And so what was the original idea of, of Aston or because you went big, you didn't go for let's raise 10 or 20 million and put that to work. Um, you really went for, and we're going to unpack that as well, to go after, maybe not with the first fund necessarily, but definitely with the follow-up ones to, to attract institutional capital. Was that from the beginning, your conviction, we need to go, I mean, I'll, I'll ask the $1 billion question, but you're, you're pretty close to that. Uh, you're going to get very close to that. Like, was it from the beginning, okay, we need to move lots of zeros and, and not just a few to move the needle? Or was, is that something that happened because the wave started to, to roll as well and you, you managed to, to serve it quite nicely? All right. Yes, I, you know, 20 years of, of venture capital prior to Astana uh, and a bit more for my co-founder, George Cuero, more like 30 years in this case, before we started Astana, um, I taught us that, um, you know, money matters and, and, and amount of money matters in this, in this business. Why does it matter? Because of what we do, we do things that um, require high conviction, for a while. Well, high conviction, what I mean by high conviction is um, there are several ways of practicing venture capital. One is you just follow, you know, the trend or you follow uh, some people who are doing things and, and you put money following those people. And statistically, if you have good investors in front of you, uh, you don't have to have a lot of conviction. You just have to be, um, you know, to be convinced in a way that those people are, know what they are doing. So I'm not going to give you names of firms, but you know, everyone knows. Following, yeah. Yeah, you can follow those firms and, and you'll do well. And, and you don't need to have yourself a lot of conviction about the, uh, the sector or the companies or the people that you are working. There are times where um, it takes a while for a company to, to really take off, to really go through a, a um, you know, a, a a certain amount of time where, you know, things are going to look uh, pretty bad. I mean, take Amazon, you know, um, it took quite a while for this, this company to become the powerhouse. It, it became, it lost money for a while. And so investing in such companies, I'm not talking you about, you know, Amazon stomach. is not. You need to have the stomach to stay. Yeah. Exactly. You need to stop, but you need to have the conviction that between the, the idea, between the, the, the timing, the idea, the, the, the product market fit, and very importantly, the management team, which you may have to augment, or you may have to do something about it, which is what we do most of the time, you know, is help in, in one way or another. We help um, bring new people into, into that. That's, you know, you, you, you are going to be um, pushed by um, a lot of people around you saying, I don't believe in that. I don't understand how you can believe in that. I don't understand how you can have put money into that company. I don't see the, the, the future. This is a big mistake and so on. But if you are really convinced of that, you, you have to have the staying power to do that. So if you have a really small fund and, you, and, and you're going to be, you know, pushed away by other people or you'll be, you're going to be washed away or you won't be able to put the resources to um, sustain this, this company yeah. that, that uh, for a while. So that's why we, we thought from the beginning, you know, um, eventually we need to have that, um, that power to, to back our convictions. It took much, <laughs> not much longer, it was much shorter than we thought. So. Um, yeah, the first fund that we wanted to raise. Of, I mean, we had a very small fund that was more like us and, and a couple of friends. But the first fund we wanted to raise, we thought, you know, maybe we'll, we'll be 100 million and, and, and then we'll have another one. And then it turned out to be pretty much 300 million. So that's... that's um, Three times, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the, the next one, which I we, remember a chat we had at that time, you said, we raised a bit more than we expected, which is good. But it's also a challenge because, of course, you have to put it to work. It's not that you can leave it on a bank account. I mean, for a while, because you can follow your convictions, etc. But uh, yeah, your investors expect you to to put that. So what made you decide to not 
put a hard cap at, at 150 or 200 and call it a day and, and go for the, and, and take the 300. Was it a conscious, I mean, of course it's a conscious decision, but like you were like, okay, actually I can see the deal flow and the quality for even that amount, so let's do it. Yes, I mean, that's, a, that's the latter actually. We, we started, when we started to look at the sector and made a few personal investments around 2015, 16, you know, at the very beginning, there were very few projects that made sense. You know, we, uh, we invest in agri-economy at the very beginning of agri-economy, I mean, companies like that, but um, which now just raised a, a big round of financing. But the, there were very few entrepreneurs that, that were um, having a combination of vision, a level of ambition that match our desire to have a systemic impact. Um, and the technology um, breakthroughs, the product. Is that a fundamental one for you that it has to have that, that breakthrough piece you mentioned before that, that happened around 2009 at, at the core somewhere to, not, not at the core somewhere, at the core, because otherwise it won't scale fast enough? Would you say most of your companies have that somewhere? Yes, as a yes, for the most part, yes. I mean, virtually all of them. And the, but the technology breakthrough is not necessarily a uh, you know a company, AI breakthrough. It could be something. Most of the time now, by the way, it, it is linked to biology in one way or another. Um, and if it's not biology, it might be mechanical, like Monarch tractors, but linked to a um, a way to deal with the soil in a very different way. You know? um, because if you can, if you can pinpoint, you can very precisely where to do things in, in the least um, um, you know, intrusive way and, and be uh, very precise in what you are going to put in the soil. That's a big breakthrough from that point of view. And is time and, and the, the normal, let's say, VC um, time frame of a fund, we've discussed it many times on the podcast that it's, it's, it's not yeah, it's tricky, let's say. It's difficult or it's a challenge, the speed of which returns are required and, and the speed of which does these companies have to, to scale and grow, etc., which we need for the planet. Let's not, not discuss that because, of course, it's not we can wait 20 to 30 years because that's way too late. But the seven or the eight or nine years, do you see that that, that was designed for Silicon Valley and, and software, most of it, and maybe part of hardware, have you experienced it as a challenge for, let's say, the, the food and ag tech space to, like, we need these returns relatively fast and we need to put 300 million to work. Is that, is that been a puzzle and thus uh, a challenge? Or you said, actually, there's enough deal flow that can do that. And, and we are convinced that um, also with the, v, the normal VC, the traditional quote unquote VC methods we, and structure, we can actually, uh, we can make a meaningful, meaningful dent. That's a very good question. I don't think we have a full answer to date, but you're right. Um, it's not just about agri-food, it's also about other sectors that require um, longer time than... Um, you know, if, if you develop an antivirus software, uh, you push a button and you have a billion antivirus software that are being pushed to customers. If you grow insects in a vertical farm, you push in, a button Paris, yeah, and then yeah. it takes nine months for the, the which things is to, fast for, for which is fast. animal protein. Yeah. And then another year for that and so on. So <clears throat> it takes, you, you have to deal with nature and, and nature has seasons and nature uh, you know, deals with things at a certain speed. Even if you can incredibly um, accelerate thanks to AI and computing power, the, for example, the selection of, of new species or new variety of plants that, that correspond to a certain level without doing gene editing necessarily, you know, just looking at the acceleration of that today with AI, you can go from, you know, 12 years to a year. But still, it's, it's a year and it's, it's, a year. Not, yeah, and it's not three but, days. Yeah. But that's why I meant initially about the, the breakthrough. So did you tell your investors like, look, this, this is not your typical SaaS Series B, like right. this could take or did you build something in to make it to give you a bit more time, or well, was that tricky in the first? Place? It's a tricky, it's a tricky thing. Eventually, we'll get there. Um, but you're right; we are, you have to remind our investors, for the most of them, that it's it takes time. So every year we remind them that it takes time. 
because it's human, you know, you put money somewhere and uh, you're antsy, you say, oh, okay, I want my money back. Yeah. And they might go through that, that J curve and, and the, difficult, uh, the difficult years. And now with Fund 2, are you doing things differently or is it mainly same investment thesis, bigger, obviously, um, or, or are there structural things you do, you do differently? I think we we as a, you know we have uh, built a team, so um, there's a difference between what we are doing at the very beginning. You had two guys in the garage um, making small investments, um, and and now we have a we have more of a you know professional team with about 35 people that are on two continents, and so it's 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 a very different process. But we what we do um, we and we really work hard on is to keep that pioneering spirit of, you know, every single deal is the most important deal we are working on and, and every single company we have invested in is the most important company that we have ever invested in before. And, and keeping that, I would call that, you know, almost animal spirit, especially in the case of um, agri-food, is, is very important. So we, we, we are not... I think we are not, you know, complacent or anything like that. We think that it's just the very beginning. I mean, this um, transition is going to be, un be unfolding for the next 15, 20 years, at least in front of us. And so we're just at the very beginning of what's going on. And what has changed or has something changed of, of the appetite of investors, like the conversations you have now compared to uh, 2017, 18, and when, when you were raising the first fund. Um, has that changed? Has, are the, the, the institutional ones, the, the, the larger pockets, are they finally coming? What has been, in, in a very challenging environment we're in now, obviously yes. we're recording this in, uh, in November 2022. Um, what, what, is, yeah, what, what is your feeling of, of the, the markets or, or also of the second fund? Is it going to be, is, is there more interest and also conviction to actually put significant amount to work? I mean, you already raised 300 million almost, so significant definitely, but you know you're targeting a, a considerable larger one. What has been the response from, uh, from investors? So it's interesting <clears throat> because um, this year, not surprisingly, um, private investors, especially in smaller family offices, are much more cautious about uh, making long-term illiquid commitments. Um, um, there are a number of endowments and pension funds that have rules, um, prudential rules that make sense because of the disbursement. You know, university endowments need to be able to disburse to uh, students that need um, bursaries. They need to do things with research. Same for pension funds. They need to be able to. So, so they have ratios of uh, public equities which are liquid to private equities. And because of the, you know, the collapse in, in the value of public equities, suddenly the value of private equities have gone up. And for them, um, they, they, many of them totally stopped the um, new commitments in private equity, which includes venture capital. So that's a little bit of a challenge. On the other hand, what we are seeing for the first time is that um, the really large asset managers, the, the, the big insurance companies, uh, you know, the big multi-asset managers, have a mandate or, and or political pressure, depending on which countries they are in, to invest in impact investing. But being big institutions, they are looking for big tickets. Uh, that's why they have invested in, in some of the la very large TPG, TPG and, yeah. KKR and so on. But now they're looking at... Big tickets are 100, 50, 200. Yeah, what? It's very difficult for many of them to put less than 100. For some really, really large one, it's like 500 minimum. Um, and, uh, and then the smaller one is 50 plus, you know. So, But we are seeing them suddenly, because we, are, we have been growing recently in, in our fund size, and, uh, and we are Article 9, um, 9.3, which is very rare in terms of, of um, investment. Uh, so it's the SFDR um, taxonomy to say that we are real impact 
because a real impact feels like Twitter blue, where we all impact. <laughs> you bought your blue, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, it was 999 per month. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So we, thanks to that, now we are Article 9. But um, we are, um, and that's, you know, there are not that many um, places where those people can invest. So suddenly we see a lot of interest, at least theoretical interest for now. Uh, but I think it's good news for all of us who are working uh, sincerely in that sector that are genuinely uh, investing in impact investing for the agri-food space. There is a handful of funds that, that are doing that at, at a certain size. And I think it's very important that we have that power to invest in later stage investments. Uh, they are not just seeds, they are not just Series A, but we can go at a higher level because those companies will need sustained power because you know, they, are, they are changing the world. It's not going to happen overnight. They will not be profitable overnight. And that, again, requires high conviction. Um, we have a lot of colleagues, uh, venture capitalists, who are dealing at the, uh, at the lower um, amount level because it's early, earlier stage. They are doing a fantastic job of, of nurturing those companies. There's not enough money going into the next stages, you know, the growth stage. The growth, not in the sense of what people are doing today with uh, more mature industries. Um, this, these are still pioneering industries. And if it takes another five years for a company to be profitable or another three or four years, it's really difficult to find today that uh, to fund that gap. 10, 20 million to, to go oh, or, more. Yeah, or more. Probably more, like 100 million. How do you find that today is a challenge for many companies. So we think you know, this new interest from the very large asset managers for this type of impact fund, some of them, like ours, will be, um, you know, channeled to the agri-food space. This is key for the sector to, um, to get there, because otherwise we won't be able to fund this transition. And what would you tell like, the private investors that are holding back a bit now. Let's say we're in a theater and, and it's, it's a room full of, uh, of private investors and, and the smaller endowments and family offices. And what would you tell them? Obviously, we're not giving investment advice, but what would you like to leave when they leave the room, when they leave the theater? What should be the, the thought on their mind? Where should they go and, and, and dig a bit deeper? Or where should they go and, and understand more of this, this space? What is a good place to, to start? Um, as you said, we don't want to give uh, investment advice, certainly. Um, I think the, the, the first thing to, to really realize is um, regenerative agriculture is going to happen. Because, like it or not. Yeah. Because there's no choice. Um, the good news is what we are seeing right now is you have um, thousands of, of uh, really bright entrepreneurs who were not thinking about that before. They were not thinking about, you know, about regenerative agriculture. They were not thinking about biology that needs to be developed. They didn't think about mechanic, uh, mechanical engineering that needs to be developed, about big data that needed to be developed for region ag to become really uh, the mainstream. Do you see the deal flow now yes. coming? Like do you see also a shift in like the investments Astana has been making? Like, is it getting more into the, the ag space or the region ag space, or has it always been food plus plus ag, or has it been like the, the the themes have they been shifting over the years of investing and, and thus going forward? I think initially the low hanging fruits were more on the food side, you know, because it it. Um, uh, made a lot of sense and, and so on. Ag, we have been trying to do things around that. But um, there is some fundamental data plays that need to happen um, for region Ag to be um, on par in terms of, of profitability from a farmer's level point of view. The other thing is farmers don't have the money to invest in that. So it needs to come from, from something else or we need to have the means to um, you know, point them into a, a new process, new form. So th the good news and the bad news is there is a huge generational transition happening everywhere in the Western world when it comes to farmers. Um, so 
the numbers vary between you know 50%, 75% in the next 10 years, 15 years in the US, in Canada, in, in Western Europe. Um, there will be new uh, farmers, I mean, the, you know, existing farmers will need to retire or will retire. And then s someone needs to take over. So the bad news is many, many, uh, I mean, a, a large proportion of the, the, the children of farmers don't want to become farmers because they've seen the uh, progressive um, destruction of, of lifestyle that the, 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 this current generation has had. They had a great time, regardless of what they were using in terms of, of uh, techniques and, and products and everything until recently, but they have been going down now. And we might be able to, as a society, I'm not talking about you know, us, us two here on this table, but we might be able to attract people back into a new form of farming because of technology, because of you know, data-driven decisions and so on, that will make farming much more, um, much more livable. I'm not even talking about, you know, but you'll be, if you can be in, you know, in the countryside, in nature every day, if that's something you are really attracted to, and you don't have to break your back, you don't have to walk, um, you know, 90 hours a week to uh, make um, barely minimum wage and even less, uh, you know, that's, that's not very attractive. But if you can do something better than that, if you can actually have a, a, a business model that makes sense, so we have been working with uh, Hectare in, in, in France and um, Audrey Bourlot. She has done a fantastic job at, at modeling you know, what it takes to, um, to make farming again an attractive, uh, an attractive uh, position, I mean an attractive career proposition. And uh, I think this is the, the imp important thing to realize is we are getting to the point where you know, what we see in terms of technologies everywhere, new technologies, new processes, is likely to make that happen. So there are a number of, of companies out there that are just starting to grasp what needs to happen and what needs to be delivered um, to the farmers, to the companies that are buying from farmers, which is very important, the ecosystem, companies that are you know, selling to farmers. So all this ecosystem needs to adapt. And, and I, to me, looking at the trends and, and, and the willingness from a number of, of people to, um, to, um, to push that evolution, I think we're, you know, it's going to happen. So message is... Um, it will happen. It will happen. And, and there are already some really interesting companies to invest in. So the choice is you want to be part of the journey or not. And are you... Are you optimistic? You said it's going to take 15, 20 years, and then you described a number of technologies, and, and we don't have time to unpack all of them. But are you optimistic in, at this moment um, in this transition phase? Yes. If VCs always have to be optimistic. Yeah. yeah, otherwise I would do something else, you know, definitely. No, I'm, I, okay, everyone tells me I'm, I'm too optimistic. They've been telling me that for 25 years. I'm right enough times to be um, to continue to be optimistic. I think you know not every company is going to be succeeding in that space. It may take longer. Something will go faster than than others. Uh, but I can see this moment. I mean, this momentum building into what, what is really the most um, you know the the, be, the highest reason to be uh, to be optimistic is to see the level of brain power that is being poured into that sector to think about next level solutions in the right direction. It's, uh, it's unparalleled. I've, it, the people who are meeting more and more uh, on, a, on a higher frequency basis is, is really amazing. So that's what makes me optimistic because you know, when you have this connected brain power uh, with the type of technology we have under the, that powers it uh, between biology, synthetic biology, you know, AI and, and so on. It's, um, I, I cannot tell you about all the projects we are seeing, but some of them are mind blowing. And the consumer is 
starting to. Shift. And then on the other side, the consumer. Because somebody has to buy this. Obviously, it's like we cannot just throw it on lower costs and, and that will be okay. And input costs, etc. I mean, at the yeah. But if we go back to the very beginning, if you have a you take the U.S. and you have a mostly private sector uh, health insurance, who are going to die. I mean, these companies, these healthcare companies are all going to go bankrupt if they don't do something. They're going to move and okay. they're going to mandate a number of things. They're going to push people, they're going to push enterprises, they're going to push consumers, they're going to push a lot of things you to happen. the health angle is the... The health angle is one of the big ones. Um, and the, you know, the consumers themselves, the younger generation, who I think the health angle is going to be the real driver more than you know, environmentally conscious people, which are a big minority, but they are not the majority yet. You know, people, people still think that someone else can take care of that, not them, because they are, you know, busy. they are busy and they need to take their cars to go somewhere. And, and, and I fully understand them. Um, but the health, care, the health side is, is going to drive that. And I want to be conscious of your time and ask a final question, which is never the final question. But if you had a magic wand and you could change one thing overnight, could be in food and ag, could be in general economy, society, etc. What would you change? I have people that say, yeah, we'll change this, this, this. No, one thing. If you could change only one thing overnight, what would that be? Probably, <laughs> probably, I think... They're not one thing to change. That's the issue. It's okay. <laughs> if you have, there, there, there are yeah. so <laughs> many um, pieces in the system that need to change, and they all are interconnecting to one another. I would try, I would start with the soil. I would start with the soil. I would, I would, um, you know, make every. I would give every farmer a magic wand that says, "Yeah, I'm." Now I know that I need to take care of my soul differently, and I, and I have this, you know, this new toolbox that doesn't cost me more than before, that I will be using from now on, and that will progressively regenerate the soil I'm on. If you give that to the farmers, they will all say yes, because the land, as David Montgomery, who you know, I really admire, I spent very lucky to have spent quite a bit of time with him personally, you know, every farmer knows that the land is the most important part they have, the, the most important asset they have. But if they cannot, you know, if it's too expensive for them and, and too time consuming to do it, they won't be able to do it. But if I have this magic box, they have this box and now they are putting that on the tractor and it will regenerate the soil over time. I think that's what we should start with. Everything else will then flow through. And it's also a mindset piece there for farmers that want to, but might not, like the neighbor you mentioned earlier on, might not want to see or are able literally to see that there are other ways. Because if you're stuck in, in this system for, for 70 years, it's very difficult and very confrontational to think that might be something going wrong. And to step out of that is... is for the very few and the stubborn, the crazy, the etc., and, and not everybody can be there. So to, to change the, I think somebody said the, the most probably Gabe Brown, the most difficult piece is between the ear, the real estate between your ear to change. Maybe I'm not quoting him right, but and final question, and I really stop. When you go, I don't know if you go often to like Regen conferences, there are not so many, but when you are in the region crowd, where are you contrarian? This is definitely inspired by John Kemp, who asked that question, like, where do you think differently, or where you don't agree, or where others don't agree with you in your own, in your own bubble, let's say. When you go there, what's, um, where, do you, where are you contrarian? Is that the, the machine learning piece, or the technology piece? Is the optimism piece, maybe, or we need more than a billion to put to work, or VC can work here, but what would be the main thing you said, I'm actually... Uh, thinking quite differently than, than a lot of other people in, in region ag and food. So, could be a kind of worms. This. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, uh, and again, um, I invited John Kempf and he came um, here to, uh, to Brussels a couple of years ago. It was really fun. Um, He's a great character. Yeah. Yes. We, um, I think the, the idea that people, consumers 
will actually, um, majority of them will, will say, you know, I'll make that purchase decision because of environment or um, if it's better for, better for the environment. I, I'm not really convinced of that. I'm not convinced of that. They, um, you know, it's, I, um, I think people, I mean, and, and again, I'm not sure they will make very easily a uh, decision about their health. The, the big issue we are having, if I, if I stop being totally optimistic for now, for one second, is that um, when you tell people, wow, you're eating really badly, I'm going to show you all kinds of different things, you know, your sugar spike and, and everything and so on. And, and people say, oh, okay, well, that's bad. What, what's going to happen to me? And we say, well, in 25 years, you're going to develop, you know, diabetes. Or, and, or in, in 35 years, you'll be dying of, uh, at a much higher rate of, of uh, you know, some cardiovascular thing. And they say, wow, well, that's bad. Maybe I'll do something in 20 years. And for the next 20 years, I don't care. I'll continue to eat my... my How do my, we bring it forward? Basically? That's right. So, yeah, people, you know, people have been, I mean, people as animals, you know, we have been wired to be extremely efficient at, you know, fleeing, um, you know, immediate danger. So we are really good at getting a lot of adrenaline and, and run. But when you tell someone, you know, to stop eating this, this uh, milkshake every day because, you know, in, in, in 10 years or even five years, something bad is going to happen, we're not really good at, at you know, at like dealing with climate that. change and sea level rise. Like, yes. stop driving this because in 15, 20, 35 years, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah so think it's, about it. uh, it's only when people get exposed to immediate issues. So, you know, big droughts, extreme hail that destroy everything around them. Um, when people are exposed to that and they see that it's happening more and more, then suddenly the climate becomes part of the global discussion. For um, but it's not yet on the on the horizon. For it's starting with water for the uh, for agriculture, uh, but it's not yet on the food and ag space. People are not yet feeling the the real pain. Even if still, when you have thirty percent of people, or in the Middle East, it's forty to sixty percent in some areas of the population who have developed diabetes type two. When you get past fifty percent. It means that every single person knows someone around them that has that disease, that came from bad food, they are starting to pay attention. So I think we, we are just getting to the tipping point, you know, where things are. But in a, when, when you are in these conferences and where people are trying to convince each other of what they're already convinced of, that's why I'm thinking, you know, maybe we need to think a little bit differently. What are other people thinking? You know? I want to be conscious of your time and, and thank you so much, Eric, for, for having us here and for, for sharing. And of course, good luck in these challenging times to raise a significant fund. And hopefully a few of the institutional ones will uh, not just, um, like, talk is cheap, not just do, oh, we're interested and oh, but actually follow through, which is way more difficult because you have to jump through. I don't know how many institutional hoops to, to get it signed, but you have experience with that. Um, so good luck with that and hopefully we have some nice announcements uh, soon. Thank you, Kun. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you like this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.